Let me begin with this question today. What's one thing you know you need to do, but you don't do for whatever reason? One thing, I know that this is what I need to do. It's going to be helpful to me, but for whatever reason, I don't do it. If you're like me, many things are coming to your mind right now. Anyone? Don't leave me standing up here alone. There's all kinds of things that are coming to my mind from eating better, healthier, to finishing up that house project that I was supposed to get done at the beginning of the summer, and now it's coming to the end of the summer. Now is anybody with me? All these things. But I don't want you to think of anything like that. I want to talk about one thing that fuels everything, that feeds everything, that helps every single thing. What is it? Solitude. Some people define solitude as being alone without feeling lonely. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm not just talking about you being alone to get some rhythm and get some rest and get rejuvenated on your own. I'm talking about alone time with God. Real solitude. We need it. I need it. That's what I want to talk with you about. Why do we need it? Man, I'm so glad you asked that question. Open your Bibles to Psalm 63. Psalm 63, we are concluding our series today. I thought about what can I share with you? How can I conclude this series in the best way, this series, Summer of Rest? And I believe as I was praying about this for the last couple of weeks, the Lord put on my heart this psalm as a reminder to each of us to engage in more solitude. It gives us five specific reasons why it's so critical, why it's so important for us to engage more. Did you catch that word? Meaning, are we doing it? If not, we gotta get started. If we are, we gotta do a little bit more. That's what I'm going for. And again, as I've been praying through, it's been a good series. Has it been good? And uh, Jody and I were just thankful. Uh, I've been off for the last few weeks, and it's just good to be back. I want to welcome all those here in the house and all those online. But as I've been praying about what to speak on, I'm unclear as to whether or not this is just a message for me, and I'm allowing you to listen in, which could be scary. Or I think it's also a message for everyone. Not to just tack onto this series. Because if we want to experience the promises of God, if you're new today, I want to welcome you. That's what we've been talking about all summer. The promises of God. If you want to experience them to the fullest, then solitude is needed and necessary. And experiencing Resting in the promises of God is a mirage for the Christian without solitude. It, it's impossible. You, you can't do it. So I'm speaking to you, but first I'm speaking to myself. Look with me at Psalm 63. I'll begin in verse 1. Oh God, you are my God. I earnestly seek you. My soul thirsts for you. My flesh faints for you, as in a dry and weary land where there is no water. So I have looked upon you in the sanctuary, beholding your power and glory, because your steadfast love is better than life. My lips will praise you, so I bless you as long as I live. In your name, I will lift up my hands. My soul will be satisfied as fat and rich food, and my mouth will praise you with joyful lips. When I remember you on my bed and meditate on you in the watches of the night, for you have been my help 
And in the shadow of your wings, I will sing for joy. My soul clings to you. Your right hand upholds me. If you believe that to be true, give me an amen right now. But those who seek to destroy my life, my enemies, shall go down in the depths of the earth. They shall be given over to the power of the sword. And they shall be a portion for jackals. Speaking about the protection and provision of the Lord. Verse 11, but the king shall rejoice in God. All who swear by him shall exalt, for the mouths of liars will be stopped. Father, use your word to speak to our hearts on this day. Whether we're here, whether we're tuning in from a place on vacation or away, use your word to convict us, to challenge us, to encourage us so that we would engage in greater, deeper ways with you. I pray that for myself. I pray that for the brothers and sisters here and for all who are within the sound of my voice. Lord, we love you. We're grateful that your word feeds us. May it feed us now. If you agree with that prayer, simply say amen. Amen. First reason. Going to give you a reason why we need to engage in this solitude. And so what's the first thing? Well, I engage in solitude. Solitude does something. It helps me to seek God earnestly. Like I can seek God in earnestly through the discipline of solitude. And so that's where David, the writer of this psalm, begins. Now look at the phrase. He says in verse 1, are you with me? Two people are with me. Are you with me? Verse 1. He says, oh God, you are the God. Does he say that? No, he doesn't say that. He doesn't say the God, although that would be true, that he is the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He doesn't say for sure, oh God, you are a God, as in he worships multiple gods, because there's only one true God. He's monotheistic, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob, so important to just slow down and get the details in scripture. Why does he say my? He's like that little kid. You know that little kid. Some of you got those little kids. Mine, 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 mine. And he grabs some. No, just share, please share. Everybody's around. You better share. (laughs) Mine, mine. He's claiming the personal pronoun of God for himself. We just can't run by that. Oh, oh God, you are my God. And then look at the three phrases he gives us. I mean, they are unbelievable phrases because they depict his relationship with God, how much he needs God. Look at the poetic phrases that David uses. He says, I seek you. He says, my soul, it thirsts for you. He says, my flesh faints for you. If we double click on that word faints, it's an interesting one in the Hebrew language. And so that's what the Old Testament is written in. It's the only time we see it in the entirety of the Bible. It literally means to go dark. It literally means to be blind without you. So David has said, I cannot see, I cannot move, I cannot go forward, God, without you. Are we on target? Psalm 63, solitude. And then look at that last phrase in, um, in these first verse. It says, there is no water. Hold that thought. Hold that thought, because we all need water, right? We are the most hygienic, uh, hydrated generation that ever existed. <laughs> People are walking around like, what the heck is going on? Everybody's got their cup. Just hold up your cup if you brought your cup to church. What is wrong with you people? <laughs> It's a gallon jug. I go work out at a club near here, and it's like the people got the gallon jug. I'm like, what the hell? Are you going to drink all of that? (laughs) And so listen, we got to be hydrated. Let's talk about Pastor Craig, our executive pastor, for a moment. Can we do that? Draw the spotlight right here. We love him, man. Come on, give him a hand. So grateful to God that he's with us and shepherding us. So Craig's a runner. He's told you that one too many times to count. But if you go in his office, I was in his office because he was on vacation. He was in Europe. What was he doing in Europe? He's running. That's all he does. And so look at this picture. Put it up on the screen. This is a picture from his office 
of, look at this, it's the United States, and you can't see it, I wish you could see it better, but, but it's got little, little markers of every race that he's run in the US. And he has a goal to run in every single state. And it sickens me that he's almost there. <laughs> I mean, what is going on with this guy, man? I, like, I go on vacation. I don't want to run. Anybody with me? Yeah. I want to eat, therefore I run. But, <laughs> but in seriousness, those are all the medals that he's gotten in the 5Ks, the 10Ks, the marathon. Imagine for a moment, Pastor Craig's running. I don't know, he's in Oklahoma. He's in Tennessee. And he says, for this race... I'm going to just run by the water stop and nobody's going to get any water. And he just tears the tables and he thinks he's Jesus turning the tables in the temple <laughs> and nobody gets water. I mean, it would be foolish that not, he, he wouldn't do that. He couldn't do that. Just as a runner, a marathon runner, a racer needs water to rejuvenate and to sustain and to complete the race. We need God as our source of energy and strength and rejuvenation to complete the race of life. And we've got to stop at every water stop. That's what David's talking about. And some of us neglect it. But if I'm going to have solitude, I need more of it and more of it means that I need to seek God. Second reason why solitude is so critical for us and why we need to do more of it is because it helps me to experience God. And I can experience him, secondly, fully. That's the only way that I can experience the fullness of God. Yes, there's other di disciplines like fasting and prayer and witnessing, and fellowship. But this is one, I don't know, am I the only one that neglects it? It's just, I just gotta get some solitude, some alone time, some think time with him, with the Lord. And look what he says next in verse two. He says, so I have looked upon you in the sanctuary. So now David, the writer here, he is, the sanctuary can be de determined to be the tabernacle because the temple doesn't exist yet. His son would go on to build the temple. And so this is the tabernacle. This is the place that he experienced God to the fullest. And so it's not the only place, but it's the place. Just like when we come to church, did you sense God's presence in our worship time? He's here. Now, there's a difference between omnipresent, which means God's everywhere. He's going to be at the restaurant that you go to after church. And he's omnipresent. He is everywhere at all times, blows our minds. But his manifest presence is what we feel. His manifest presence is through his spirit. And that's when we gather together in worship, we can sense his manifest presence and so David is remembering the times at the altar, the times at the tabernacle, the times when he made some decisions for God. And so we've experienced him. And it's good to remember those times. And so he says, I looked upon you in the sanctuary, beholding your power and glory, because your steadfast love is better than life. If we double click on steadfast love, two English words from one Hebrew word, hesed, that's the covenantal love of God that is unwavering and unbroken, that God loves us. He loves you so deeply. He's made a promise, and we want to experience the fullness of his promises. And then look what it does, because what happens with David, he's a worship leader at heart. He plays the harp, plays the guitar, plays all kinds of things, probably the kazoo, just kidding. But, but what, what, what does it cause him to do? When he experiences the fullness of God, two times in these verses already we see he praises God. It says he lifts his hand. He, he's worshiping him. That's what solitude leads to, experiencing the presence of God because of his steadfast 
love. So question, major application coming now. Like, when, when should we do this? Like, when exactly should we do this? Well, the Bible says pray without ceasing. All the time? Well, that's the lifestyle. Let's take a look at Jesus. This is going to come fast. I'm going to give you a Bible study in the New Testament. Jesus was really good at what we are looking at. He's our example to follow. And so here's the specific instances. They're not all of them, but I picked some of the best ones that he sought God, that he engaged in solitude. So let's learn from Jesus. Engage in solitude when making a big decision. Hey, you got something that you're wrestling with at work or at home or with the kids, a decision about moving, a decision about going over here, going over there, whatever it is, solitude's gonna be helpful. I wanna show it to you. We're gonna move fast, but I'm gonna show it to you in the text, and then I'm gonna show you that Jesus engaged in solitude. So look, it came to pass in the early days that he went out to the mountains to pray. There it is, and continued all night in prayer. There it is. He's experiencing solitude. Why? because he was about to choose the 12 who he would name apostles. So he was trying to figure out, Ooh, who should I tap on the shoulder? He engaged in solitude. Second one is this. Let's move fast. Engage in solitude when facing a great challenge, an opportunity, or a responsibility. Jesus, he said to them, let us go on the next towns that I may preach there. That is what I came, why I came out. So he's praying. He's going forward as a result of the responsibility. The next one is this. Engage in solitude when grieving a loss. Here, Jesus is grieving the loss of a special friend, a loved one. Maybe you're grieving a loss of something, a relationship. Maybe it's a loss of a job. Whatever the loss is. In this case, Jesus is grieving. Herod is the one who beheaded John the Baptist. And it says when Jesus heard about this, look what he did. He withdrew from there in a boat to a desolate place by himself to engage in solitude. Third one is this, engage in solitude when dealing with the pressure of being known, sought after, and needed. Hey, you may feel needed extremely at home with your family, with your kids, at the workplace, at whatever. Jesus was needed. He's healing people. He's doing all these things. After he does them, he dismisses the crowds and he dismissed them. What did he do? He went up to the mountain by himself to pray. He's engaging in solitude. Next is this. Engage in solitude when in need of rest, recovery, rejuvenation. This is the one I need. I'm just going to rest and engage in solitude for the month of July and it's going to last me the whole year. I, I wish I was joking. Pressing on to the next thing. Like we don't engage enough. And so I, I get a lot of solitude in this month. But, but it can't last forever. Jesus models continually. Look, the great crowds are up with him. They're geared to hear him. He's teaching him and he's healing him. And what does he do after? After you're expended with meeting the needs of other people. You need to take care of yourself. How do you take care of yourself? Hey, don't just go shopping online. Don't just eat some food that is good. I mean, what, what? Like, 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 get alone with the Lord. Next, he does this. Helpful stuff? Okay, I'll give you another one then. Engage in solitude when enduring great trials and difficulties. So, so here, Jesus is in Gethsemane. He's there. He knows what's coming. The greatest trial. He's going to die for the sins of the world. The Bible says he becomes sin. And he said to his disciples, sit here while I go over there and pray. Solitude, last one is this. Engage in solitude when fulfilling your purpose, your passion, your calling. And so I won't read the whole thing, but again, Jesus, what does he do? He engages in solitude because why? I must preach the good news of the kingdom to God to other towns. Like that's what he was, he came to do. So these are the times that we should engage in solitude. But I don't have that kind of time. Are you telling me to go on a two-day retreat? Are, are you saying like, yes and no. I realize not everybody can do that. I, I, I get it. But that's the next reason. 
The next reason to engage in solitude is because solitude, it does this, it helps me to trust God completely. And so what David does next is he obliterates this idea that it has to be a 48-hour retreat or leaving for a weekend or a week. No, look what he says. He says in the next verse, when I remember you upon my bed, verse 6, when I meditate on you in the watches of the night, for you are my help, and in the shadow of the wings I will sing for joy. Again, it leads him to worship. It's going to lead us to worship today as we close the service. We're not done yet. But what's he saying? I sit at my bed before I fall asleep, and I meditate on the Lord. I mean, to the young mom who... It's just like, I mean, are you kidding me? When am I going to find some time for this? Hey, you put that kid down for a nap. Finally, praise the Lord. And that your little beautiful child that the Lord has entrusted with to you. I mean, that you could grab 10 minutes, that you could grab 20 minutes of solitude to the business person who's traveling and they got that account and you got to drive to Wisconsin. That, that, that you would turn the music off and that you would tune everything out and, and that you would engage in solitude with God to the person who, well, I got you know, I, I to go to lunch or, and I got, only got a half an hour, that you would set your lunch aside for a moment and for the first 10 minutes engage in solitude by yourself. I mean, if we want to do it, we will do it. I'm just saying it doesn't have to be for like 90 minutes. Short spurts of solitude are, are really helpful. But what about the, let's just go right after the jugular. Let's go after your excuse. Why you don't engage in solitude. And I'm really good at saying your excuse when it's really mine. So here's the list. We'll put it up on the board. These are the ones I thought of for myself. I, I'm too busy. Sometimes I'm just too lazy. Sometimes I'm complacent. I mean, I'm not going to read the whole thing. Which one is you? Like, like just pick it. What is it? I, I, I'm just bored. I, sometimes it's like we have to fill our time with people and relationships. And our number one relationship gets crowded out. Social media? Do you know that the average person, just look this up today, the average person spends two hours and 23 minutes on social media. Hold on, I just got to text a friend of mine. <laughs> Kidding, I mean, but isn't it true that, so, so what is it? And then I just put, I don't know, what, what's yours? What, what, what exactly is yours? Here's a great um, couple quotes from Celebration of Disciplines, which I would just really recommend. This is a great work. It's an old one. You know, I only give you guys the classics. And, and he says, Richard Foster, in solitude we are freed from our inner bondage to people and our inner compulsions, and we are freed to love God and know compassion for others. And then he goes on to say this, Richard Foster. He said, inward solitude, that's what we need. Inward solitude is outward manifestations. There's the freedom to be alone, not in order to be away from people, but in order to hear the divine whisper better. That's what we're going for. Divine whisper. I wrote this definition down for solitude. So this is the definition for solitude. If we can go back and we can put it up on the screen, it would be great. This is the definition that I came up with. Solitude is being alone with God to refocus your mind, to recalibrate your heart, to reset your soul on the pleasures of knowing and following him. That's what we're going for. And so I love this quote, quote by Oswald Chambers. We'll go here next. And Oswald Chambers, he tells us why it's so important. He says, solitude with God repairs the damage done by the fret and the noise and the clamor of the world. I mean, so what's happening is everything is so noisy and loud. 
And, and God's asking us to turn the dial down on everyone and everything so that we can turn the dial up to hear from him. That, that's solitude. And so I don't really think I need to give you any more reasons to engage in it, but I see two more in the text. So the next one is this. Solitude, it helps me to rely on God exclusively. Like exclusively rely upon him and who he is and what he's all about and what he wants to do. And so here, let's put it up on the screen. David says, my soul clings to you. Your right hand, it upholds me. And then we get the context of the psalm. So you can kind of figure it out, but now it's like clear at you. What's the context? Hey, David's on the run. There's people looking to destroy him. So most would say that it's King Saul, although his son Absalom was on the run looking for him and going after him and wanted to hurt him too, but that came later, most likely. Most likely this psalm was penned by David when he's running in the wilderness of Judah on his own, by himself, running away from his enemies who want to hurt him and they want to kill him. And so what does he do? He engages in solitude. I wish that it wasn't just during the trying times that I engage in solitude. Just true admission. Like it ain't working over here. The situation is out of control. I don't know what to do. I have not told this story publicly for a reason. And so I'm just going to share my heart with you now. Open up my journal. And so this is a topic for me. And uh, so uh, 18 months ago, I'm with this friend of mine, young guy. Young is such an interesting term as we get older. <laughs> He's younger than me. <laughs> And just a great guy, great pastor. He was a pastor, big church in, in Dallas, if I, if I, or excuse me, in Texas. If I told you, you'd know it, Austin. And he's just an awesome guy, man. And he, he's not at that church anymore, but he's sharing over lunch. And he's like, he's like yeah, man, you, you can't believe what happened. And I knew what had happened to him. And I, and I said, tell us the story. I was there with another couple pastors. And so he says, well, you know what? I was, I was like feeling shortness of breath. And I was going up some stairs and and I'm like, what the heck? And, uh, and he calls his doctor, and his doctor was a friend of his who's a cardiologist, and he, and, he, and, he, and he cut to the chase. He gets him in emergency surgery. It was the um, widow maker. Like, he nearly lost his life. And so he's looking at us at breakfast, and he's like, if you're ever short of breath going up the stairs, call the doctor. And so, you know, I'm like, okay. You know, so we, we, I fly back from San Diego, and I'm going up the stairs. And I'm just like, I stop. And, and I'm, I'm feeling shortness of breath. I'm just like, no. And I had been feeling a little less energy. And so I did what he said. And so I called my doctor immediately. I, I described the symptoms. It was comical. And then he's like, go to the emergency room right now. And I'm like, come on. And so I got there. Didn't go right away. Now you know my personality. <laughs> so I get there, and they run a bunch of tests. And the nurse says to me, after she looked at the test, she's like, she's like how did you get in here again? And I said, I just walked in. And they're shaking their heads. And what had happened, long story short, is I had these blood clots that were in my leg. And the blood clots, there were so many of them that they had traveled up. I had had them for so long. They traveled up through my system and through my heart and into my lungs. So I had these blood clots sitting in my lungs. And one of them, they said, was the size of a golf ball that went through my heart. And so I was in the hospital for a few days. I'm fine now. I'm doing well. On my chart, it says he was near death. 
And I'm thankful for a couple things. One is where we live. I mean, sometimes we don't recognize where we live and the medical genius that is around us. And that ain't nothing to say that I believe that God saved my life. And he was the one. So I got some more time left. But it's caused me to just reflect and to just to reflect on what's really important and solitude with the Lord and what he wants you to do and where he wants you to go. And why is it that only during the trying times of the hospital room or the diagnosis or the difficulty, the things that are out of control, that we engage more fully with him? I love what it says in Psalm 34. Let's read it together. Read it with me. We'll put it up on the screen. Read with me. I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. My soul makes its boast in the Lord. Let the humble hear and be glad. Oh, magnify the Lord with me and let us exalt his name together. I sought the Lord and he answered me and he delivered me from all my fears. That's the God we worship. That's the one we can engage with. I'm going to call up our worship team, and we're thankful to have Josiah leading with us with the team. He's been here before, but Carlos, he, uh, our first time here, Carlos is a friend at High Point. We have him leading this weekend. Let's praise these guys for their goodness. They're, they're going to lead us now, and, and what we're going to do is we're going to do something a little different. And so I want to engage in solitude. I got one more reason to give you. And then we're going to engage in solitude. I'm, sh- I'm ending short. It's, it's not as long. It's not even 10 o'clock. The ushers are locking the back doors. <laughs> I want us to engage in solitude. And so preaching the word without response is just foolishness. It's just to, to hear it in my head and puff up my head and like, like it's got to get to our heart. So I'm just telling you, man, this is a topic I need. I love the Lord. Do you love God? And I want to spend time with him. And so even if you don't, just ask him, God, give me a greater desire to be with you in your presence, in your word. And God, I need you. God, I love you. And so lastly, we'll look at this last verse. It's kind of an interesting one. David says, but the king shall rejoice in God. And so who's he talking about? Is he talking about himself, maybe, that he's going to become king and rejoice in the Lord? Is he talking about Saul, who's chasing him with a spear? It's like, I I don't know. It doesn't matter. All that matters is either way, he says, all who swear by him shall exalt, for the mouths of liars will be stopped. And what David is saying is he's saying that if we experience solitude with God, then it'll result in praise. If we experience solitude with God, it'll result in his presence. If we experience solitude with God, it will have power to give you the strength to overcome the difficulties, the enemies, the lies of the enemy that have a grasp on us. And so the last reason is this. Solitude helps me worship God wholeheartedly. And so that's what I want us to do. And so my words are done. But God's word to you has just begun. And so we're just going to give you options, man. We're not into control around here. And so a little freedom. And so some or most of you were given a communion cup on your way in. You know what this is for. I'm not going to go through all of it. But the bread is representative of the body of Christ that was broken for you. The cup is representative of the blood that was shed. So you got one of these. Hey, if that's helpful to you in this experience in solitude, then just take it on your own, thinking about the sacrifice that was made. This is for those who have made a commitment to the Lord Jesus Christ and surrendered themselves to you. I say, I haven't done that yet. What a better time to do it right now, to surrender yourself for the first time, to believe in Jesus and the sacrifice that he made for you. And then if you have your Bible open, I'm just going to ask you to go ahead and turn over. If you want to, turn over or flip on your phone to Psalm 120. This is one of my favorite groupings of psalms. 
And so you could either take communion, you could read God's word. And so let's put this on the screen. And so Psalm 120 through Psalms 134 are 15 psalms. And these are called the songs of ascent. And so what the people of God did is they would read these on their way to the festival to Jerusalem as they traveled up to Jerusalem. And so these are just some great psalms. And maybe I, I put, you know, this helps me. In my Bible, I've got a little card that has these are the heading. And so they're short. You read a couple scriptures. Maybe it's, you're just going to sit. And this is the peace and quiet that you get. And the truth is, you're a parent, and you're like, my kid's up on the third floor, and I'm leaving that kid up there for the next hour. I'm joking, but do you realize that's why we do that, is so that they can learn about the Lord and that you can have some solitude with him? And so clear your mind. And I don't know, we, do you want to come up front and kneel at the altar? We're, we do that all the time. Whatever is best for you to worship him, to experience solitude. I'm asking that you would do it now. Father, your spirit, may it fall upon this place. May we seek you. May we hear you. May we worship you. I pray in Jesus' name.